I'm Besa Luce, and welcome to K2.0's podcast, Other Talking Points. In this episode, we will talk about drag culture in the region, a career, yet also a cause. Drag is thriving in our region, both as a form of art and as a tool for radical change. The vibrant art of drag is becoming ever more present in the public sphere. But as drag artists and performers find and claim their space in the public domain, they face constant backlash, resistance, and pushbacks. Being strongly linked with the celebration of queerness and LGBTQ plus rights cause, drag artists fight difficult battles in a region that has long been unaccepting, if not outright violent, towards LGBTQ plus people and allies. Reports on LGBTQ plus rights in the region speak of a hostile environment when it comes to recognizing civil rights or societal attitudes. Yet drag artists continue to rebel against deeply rooted and institutionalized patriarchy, transphobia, and homophobia. Beyond challenging homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia, drag performers play a critical role in strengthening regional solidarity between people who come together to also rebel against nationalism, racism, and other forms of oppression. In addition to being a form of rebellion, drag is developing as an industry and a career in which performers invest a lot of energy, thought, and labor. However, such labor tends to go unnoticed and perhaps undervalued, particularly when combined with an overall societal intolerance towards those who do not conform with norms or seek to shift them. To discuss the dynamics of drag art in our region, I am very happy to be joined today by Erblin Nushe, known by their drag persona Adelina Rose, and also by Lana V. Erblin Nushe is a Kosovar filmmaker, director, producer, and drag performer. They recently finished their debut feature film titled I Love You More, and have started their own film production company, Tilia Entertainment. Lana V is a Serbian drag performer from Belgrade, who has been doing drag for seven years now. Lana is one of the three members of the Bad Reputation drag shows and was also Queen of Europe Pride in 2022. Erblin, thanks so much for being on Other Talking Points. Thank you for having me. And Lana, it's great to have you here as well. Thanks, uh, thanks for agreeing to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much. It is my honor, honestly. So <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> yeah, let's let's get into it. And I let's kind of, yes, I wanted to start maybe with something a bit more personal because I thought uh, <laughs> it would be interesting to get to know the two of you a bit better. And especially, I think, to know how you decided to uh, to to become drag performers, what inspired that decision, how you went about choosing, if you can also talk about uh, how you went about choosing your drag uh, uh, personas and what they what they represent uh, uh, for you. And maybe, Erblen, I'd like to start with you. Uh, oh, it's um, It's been a long journey, honestly, because like I think uh, Adelina was part of me since I was a, a child, pretty much. I uh, expressed that part of my identity in my bedroom, like wearing my sister's clothes and um, putting on my mom's heels and like doing all of those um, choreographies and performing songs in my bedroom in front of my mirror. And I think that was always part of part of my identity that just uh, was kept inside of me. And then as I grew up and especially moving to the United States, um, I had uh, the opportunity to see drag shows and see uh, people expressing themselves and getting paid for it too. Um, and I just never even knew it was uh, a possibility to be able to just be yourself, what I did in my bedroom, to actually do it as a job. And then um, I started little by little uh, exploring the idea of dressing up, but I only did it during ha Halloween for the five uh, first five years, uh, Halloween was the only excuse for me to be expressing uh, that side of me, my feminine side. And um, my drag persona was kind of built from every time I did it, um, I realized that the blonde hair was, was, was suiting me more. And, you know, I was just building myself up more and more. And then um, 
fast forward to 2018 when I was uh, living in America and I, I had uh, been in a few movies as an actor. I was also making movies and then I met a friend who um, saw me as dressed up as a drag queen and then saw me acting and was like, you know what, I want to make a movie and I, you should be the main actor in it. And that's when I started thinking, oh my God, okay, so how do I prepare for this? And I took it very seriously and I prepared a long time for it. Um, even though the movie didn't happen that same year, um, I continued um, thinking about it and uh, I named myself Adelina and it was because of uh, the pop singer uh, Adelina Ismaili from Kosovo because uh, she changed a lot of things for um you know, our culture with our music, especially in the 90s, um, breaking taboos. And I thought that what what me doing uh, drag would be the equivalent of what I would be doing for the queer community in present day, uh, breaking those taboos. And um, then I was like, okay, to prepare for this movie, I should perform in front of an audience at least once so I know coming back to Kosovo to film, like, how is the crew going to react? How is uh, my um, confidence going to be portraying this role? Even even if I'm just acting, um, I was just nervous, so I wanted to try it. I signed up for a contest. And I went to do it just once. And uh, I had my mom actually made me my dress uh, to perform. And she didn't even know what it was for. I just said I needed it. And I went. And what was supposed to be a one-time thing turned into now a five-year um, drag career, if I can say. Because I uh, got on stage and I was literally dying before going on stage. I wanted to vomit from nerves. And then once I was out there and I started performing, I realized that so much of my experience as an actor in theater growing up was, you know, being fulfilled as a drag queen now being on stage in front of people. I'm just a different person. This is another character, another, you know, role that I'm putting out. But the control is all me, the message, the way I look, all of it. And I loved it. So I went and did it again the next week and the next week and the rest is history. So I just kind of got roped into it. And then the year later, I did the movie um, and I was well prepared for it already by then. So um, and then I just continued. I, I never thought it would turn into something where I could actually support myself for a whole year just doing drag. Um, and it happened in Kosovo. That's the crazier part, um, that I didn't even make a living in America as a drag queen. It was more of a ho side hustle, hobby, a way of expressing and escaping reality for me. Um, but in Kosovo, it became like an, an actual, you know, like how I supported myself for a whole year. So, yeah, that's pretty much like just uh, the gist of my story and how I came to be Adelina. <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll come back later to some of those details for sure. But uh, Lana, yeah, I'd love to hear your story as well. It's been seven years now, if I'm not mistaken, that you've been uh, uh, yeah, doing, doing drag. If you can talk a bit of how you came uh, to it and uh, what it represents for you. Yeah, well, um, it's a bit different from Madalina, but I really liked your story. So <laughs> congratulations <laughs> and I'm proud you. of you, bitch. <laughs> you succeeded. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, when I was a kid, uh, my mom and dad, they really loved, I will start from the beginning, uh, Lord of the Rings movies. And uh, they were calling me Legolas, which is a character with a long blonde hair, <laughs> you know, and a uh, very feminine character. And when I was a kid, I when I was playing with my brothers and sisters, I was always that character Legolas and I was really impressed by other elves and Galadriel that was the elvish queen and everything and I was always imagining myself being some of those characters you know and after that the MTV music videos when I first saw Madonna, Gwen Stefani and uh, I don't know Fergie or Britney <laughs> uh, I was always imagining myself being in those like music videos and when I was in high school, uh, my friend told me about uh, RuPaul's Drag Race and I saw the show and I didn't understand at that time uh, the difference between trans 
people and drag queens. So I was like, it's a trans show for me in, the, in that <laughs> time. And um, after that, I figure out that there is a big difference and that drag is an art form and not just um, um, being like different gender or transgender or something um, of uh, those terms. Uh, so I learned what drag queen is and I was like, okay, I love making costumes and so my costumes. My mom is a professional makeup uh, um, artist, so I also knew something about uh, makeup. And I practiced some of the dances during my <laughs> um, middle school and high school. So I was like, okay, there is an art form that I can literally combine everything that I know, like I can do um, everything in one, like all in one. <laughs> and uh, when I figured that out, I was like, this is definitely for me. And my first performance was uh, on a party in Belgrade. One of my friends that, were, oh, that was organizing the party was like, it will be a drag team. So would you like to be on a stage and perform some songs? And I was like, sure, why not? I can try. So it was accident. Like it wasn't fully planned or booked. I just did it for free for my friend. And it was amazing because it was like thousand around 1,100 people, like almost the biggest audience in Belgrade that I performed for was my first performance. That was for me now a disaster, but it was a nice experience, a nice feeling. And when it comes to my name, um, I was really out of homophobic when I was growing up and when I was realizing that I'm queer in general and that uh, I'm pansexual and that I like uh, drag as an art form and everything. So I really struggled with that and I didn't accept myself. And I uh, found out about Shameless Series and I saw one of the characters, Ian Gallagher, and uh, how he's living in like a different environment that's not fully like um, develop a big, um, you know, center of the city or something like that. And I was like starting to accept myself while watching the series. And in that series, there is, um, there was like two characters, uh, Svetlana, and they called her Lana and Veronica, and they called her V. So I was like, I will, um, like take uh, those two nicknames and make uh, my drag name to to like um to always have a reminder that i went from from like dark places out of homophobia to uh drag artists so yeah that's my big Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And I would like to uh, go to this aspect of drag as art and drag as performative art, because I think that sometimes there's also this misconception that drag is just about putting on some clothes and a wig and, and, and performing. But it's it's more than that, of course. And it's also it's this kind of theatrical theatrical exaggeration of gender, if I if I may say, because I think within drag culture there's it's also questioning gender and social norms and i think it's also provoking provoking audiences to to do the same um so maybe um Erlin, for you what are and I, i've also seen you uh, uh seen you on stage and i know that you also use a lot of a lot of humor so what are what are some maybe particular gender conventions that you're looking into challenging through Adelina uh, uh, Rose? I know you also have experience in in, in theater, but how does that also come into uh, uh, come into play? Where do you want to kind of provoke people here with uh, with Adelina uh, Rose and with what you what you, what you talk about? Hmm, that's a layered question, <laughs> but I think one way of like, if I'm, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, but one way of, um, how I, uh, go against what people might think that drag is. And I think it's been kind of explored in the recent years, a lot more with drag queens is that I don't wear breasts. Like I'm still, I am fully okay with people knowing that I am, 
a, a biological male. Um, even though as in uh, social terms, I don't identify as a male because I'm non-binary, but that's a whole nother conversation. I, you know, I'll have moments where Nadalina has hairy arms or hairy chest or, and, and, you know, and I might look as, as beautiful as a girl, but it's still just a, a reminder that this is just a persona because to me it's really is um, a created uh, character that I can be somebody else for this period of time that it is on stage. Um, and it's very linked to theater for me personally. I think everybody's experience is differently. Um, as uh, Lana was mentioning, uh, the difference between drag and uh, trans, I think that it has a huge impact on the way people perceive us because um, some people, and especially in Kosovo, have seen drag as a gateway to express themselves with, you know, without saying really that I'm trans. That was their first steps to explore their sexuality. But for me, it was never, you know, I'm comfortable with who I am. For me, it was just transforming for those hours that I am into a completely different person because Adelina has nothing to do with Erblin. Uh, Erblin as a person, like everything is different. But the confidence that it gives me and um, I think that confidence comes from the femininity that I have shunned away my whole childhood. Now I use that as a way of, I don't know, luring the audience or um, feeling more uh, sexy in a way. But uh, then what is sexy? Just an uh, exaggerated uh, way of presenting as a female. I, there, I'm still exploring what Adelina is, really, but I, over the years, I realized more that I am more into the comedy side of it than the performance side of it. Because, again, I, as a person, I was always told that I am uh, funny and uh, just even as, as, as Erblin, but I never explored it because it was just part of my uh, identity that... Um, I wasn't myself fully, and I had I hid that. Only certain amount of people uh, were able to see that side of me and the humor. And when I was on stage as Adelina, then all of my sides and all of my colors would show. And then, little by little, I built myself into being more humorous on stage. And um, it was just always a choice of mine not to wear breasts because. At first, it was not. It was something that just proportionally for my height and stuff, I didn't feel comfortable. But then I think it's also something that nowadays people are embracing whatever they have. You know, they don't have to be. Some people like to exaggerate their, um, you know, makeup and uh, waistline and everything. Um, but for me, it was like I want to just be me, but an, a, a version of myself that I. I don't know, imagined. Um, it's a hybrid of uh, my gender and Adelina combined together. I don't know. Now I think I'm just blabbing. <laughs> no, but, no, no, you, no, you're not. But I mean, you, you also talked about earlier how also when you chose the name Adelina is for Adelina Ismaili yeah. and she represented something in the 90s for a lot of people in, in what she did with her music, with her presence on stage, uh, breaking certain like taboos, uh, even around like women and their body and sexuality and that you wanted also Adelina Rose to maybe have that same impact for the queer uh, uh, the queer community in terms of what Adelina Rose can represent or in terms of breaking certain taboos today. So yeah. what are maybe some taboos that you think are are important to be broken today and that Adelina, through Adelina Rose, you're kind of bringing them into discussion? Oh, many. I mean... Uh, the fact that I, again, I am uh, a film director, um, th that people just know me as Erblin, and then I can get up and dress up and put on makeup and a wig and a hair and then parade uh, down the capital um, and people be okay with it. And then people also come and pay to see me performing on stage. I think that is a huge, uh, a huge thing that the drag culture has allowed uh, us as a society to kind of evolve because I think if this happened 10 years ago it would be like I don't know I don't think it, it couldn't happen and um, me as a person personally I 
just the way uh, expressing yourself in any way, shape, or form. I think that is the biggest uh, taboo. And I think for Adelina Ismaili, it was specifically females. And for me, it's like everybody. Anyone can get up. And uh, and I think that's the thing, the beauty about drag is that it doesn't have to be just males emulating a different gender. It can be anybody doing drag. And... Um, as long as if if makeup or even as a person, like if I want to dress up in a dress, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's my gender or that's my uh, sexual preference or whatever. It just means that it makes me feel good. Those are the, the misconceptions that people have based on societal norms that I think I am challenging every time I get on stage and talk about things. And then drag is political, I think. I believe that because I get up and I joke about things that normally people wouldn't talk about, but they laugh and even though they know it's true. And I think in the way that is doing something because it's making people think about it. And it's a power that... I think as Erblin, if I would go up, I would get thrown tomatoes. But if Adelina says it, it's somehow somewhat okay <laughs> and acceptable. And I think in that way, she has a power that I don't know. It's just it's there. Yeah, that's, no, that, that, that's great. <laughs> uh, uh, and Lana, I, w I wanted to to ask you maybe uh, just to talk a bit about what do you think are some of the influences shaping drag culture in Serbia, but also in the region. I mean, you talked earlier about. Also, your personal influences, whether it be it with yeah. a, with yeah. a name, uh, but also then sometimes. I mean, if we look at kind of in in the West, there's a longer history, at least documented history of uh, of drag. Um, yeah. And today, what do you think? Where are the influences coming coming from? Are they highly influenced by by what we see in Western? visual media, so as to say, or West, like stories coming from, from the West, or is there also a place for local authenticity? How do you see it? It can be in Serbia or, or also in the wider region. Well, I think it's the mix of both because, yes, Western, like, um, drag is really affecting uh, the whole world. And uh, it was spreading wild in the past couple of years because of uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. So definitely it has a big impact, but... Uh, I saw um, when I was performing, for example, in Bosnia, on Croatia, or Albania, or uh, in like uh, neighbor countries, that uh, part of the queens are really using the traditional um, elements of um, each each country to to implement in their drag, especially in their comedy. When they're doing comedy, they're uh, talking about uh, the actual topics in politics or in in a society in general so i think it's definitely a good mix of both but um yeah as adelina mentioned uh, for me uh, when i'm in drag i'm more powerful and that's my superhero outfit i'm, I'm saying it like that so it's uh, easier to uh, like get the message to the audience when you're in your superhero <laughs> Uh, outfit. Uh, so some of the queens here are really uh, sending political messages and we are calling them political queens and their performances are usually influenced by the something that's happening at the moment in the world or in region or in country in general. And um, yeah, but uh, when it comes to aesthetic, I think it's... Um, affecting like um, a lot from from western um you know uh what they're doing there in 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 for example america or some other uh country i think that people are really trying to make it to the death level of the aesthetic uh, it's what uh, we are calling it uh, i don't know polish the drag or something like that but uh there are definitely some uh, really authentic, uh, authentic uh, artists that are doing something different, something gender bending, and something more, um, more um, alternative edgy <laughs> than a uh, regular femme uh, um, look. So yeah, I would say. It's a perfect mix. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, you talked about also uh, like uh, political queens, and uh, I don't know. It just mm -hmm. made me think also that we're also seeing even in we're talking we were talking also about the West earlier, and we mm -hmm. have seen 
in the past few years, there is, especially for example, in the U.S., there's these attempts to impose uh, to impose legislative measures uh, that would impact when and where drag can be uh, can be performed. Yeah. Uh, so there are these also these worrying uh, these worrying trends, and uh, I think for us also in the region, sometimes for, for, we, we, when it comes to rights or like. Uh, you know, respect of of, uh, of different rights, we tend to look to the West as the the examples of um, uh, of where rights are uh, respected. But then, when you see a trend like that developing in a place like the the, U- the U.S., you also worry like could it also have an yeah. impact uh, yes. uh, impact elsewhere? And then I think there's another kind of a layer to it that it ties into also. Um, uh, the rights of trans uh, trans people, like the worry, also I think for for uh, for them that uh, what what will happen to th- for for their right to also to uh, express their persona in public. Um, do you see this? Like, do do you watch? I don't know. I blink. We've talked also about this uh, in other occasions, uh, you and I. But like, are you kind of constantly attuned to what is happening elsewhere, or predominantly these kind of legisl- uh, legislative uh, attempts to? I I I mean I have because I kind of have to. I'm also a citizen of America, and like I'm kind of always being torn between both countries now. Like my identity is I don't know, I, whenever whatever suits me. If something is happening there, I'll go there. Something happening here, and for once, it felt like it was almost more okay to be a drag queen in Kosovo than in America, because in America they're going through that, you know. Um, fear that they might not be able to perform anymore and they might not be able to do it because it was uh, being challenged to become illegal in certain spaces where people actually depend to make their money. And if you're not making your money, you're on the street. So it's like threatening their whole um, way of living. And so as for me, um, that was uh, my reaction to that was... Uh, uh, I decided to go uh, to my film premieres dressed as Adelina because what kind of what America was saying is that, you know, being a drag queen is degrading and it's teaching our kids, you know, um, that it's uh, you're being degenerate or something, you know, whatever they're claiming, uh, which is usually tied to religion. Um, And I, as a filmmaker, and also a drag queen, I decided to go to my film premieres just to kind of show that you can be a drag queen and be successful and have a career as a director or whatever your career is. And by me showing up on those red carpets and any screening to talk about my film, even though on the programs it would say everywhere Erblin, they're presented with an Adelina on stage. I always said, you know, I want to show America and the people there that you can do other stuff even if you're a drag queen because I think that's what they were uh, kind of claiming is that you you cannot be anything in your life if you're if this is the path that you're taking and, and my message to those uh, my counter message to that was that yes I can be a drag queen and all these other things and be successful at the same time drag is just one part of my life for somebody it could be their bread and butter and everything that they do and for a good time, it's also been for me, but it never put me in that mind where it hurt me. It actually elevated me. I'm in this conversation because of it, you know? And so, um, and I think more and more people need to see and hear that. And uh, that was my way of reacting to it. Like I decided to, and then it was, it, it kind of became also like a realization that maybe uh, Adelina should just be my public figure. Like I, sh- I should not be Erblin presenting anymore. Like because there's also dangers with like I did uh, a festival in Peya where I presented and uh, I uh, received death threats after that. And so I didn't want I the beautiful beautiful thing about drag and if you're transforming in a way is that people re- don't really know that Adelina is me. And so I can only present publicly as Adelina and then Erblin can be in the shadows and have a private life. <laughs> and I think that's the power of it for me. Yeah. Yeah, but then but there are there are also are people as as Erblin, as, you, as you were mentioning that also rely on this as a career and that they seek and want to make a living uh, out of this. So uh, Lana, you've also had an experience uh, Throughout the throughout the region, as you mentioned uh, previously, do you think that the re- the region offers a platform for drag to be 
to be possible to live off of drag. Uh, so, I mean, yes, on one hand, we've talked a bit about drag being a, a personal cause. It's also like a larger societal uh, cause. But as a career, how sustainable uh, is it, do you think? Well, um, uh, I had like an opportunity to see it, of course, in Serbia and in other uh, parts of like the Balkans. And I don't think that it's easy here at all. Now I'm hearing like the situation in Kosovo, um, but uh, uh, in other countries, I don't think that anyone is uh, having a drag as the main job and just that one job, like everybody's having the main job and then drag is like the second one, especially in Serbia. I mean, um, there's one group in Serbia of drag queens, they're called House of Plastics that I know that are making like really, really big parties and uh, that are earning money that could, uh, if you're organiz organizer, that could like get you through the month. But uh, that's just like one or two queens uh, that I heard of here. Uh, everybody else are definitely not uh, living just because of drag, because it's not even that popular when it comes to audience. It's still the situation where in Balkan, uh, queer people are coming to see the drag show. So it's not like uh, someone from, there is, of course, I'm not like generalizing every, anything, but uh, it's not that popul popular among a uh, straight um, part of the society. So uh, that's the different cases from the Western countries, because for example, in America, I know that uh, everybody's coming to a drag show, everybody that wants to experience the art or something like that. But here we are uh, just expecting uh, in the audience like queer people and almost always the same people are uh, supporting drag and drag art. So I don't think that it can spread to something bigger that uh, we don't need to have the shows every week because uh, those people that are coming regularly, they don't like earn enough money to pay the drag shows like every night of the week or uh, every week in the month. They're okay with coming to two shows a month, three shows, and that's about it because they have to pay the ticket, it's going out, so it's not <laughs> that cheap. So I don't think that um, our country, the territory is not ready for us to be like... Um, um regular shows every night shows because the audience there's not much of the audience that would like come every night to see a drag show so i think uh, we have a long way to go and um, when it comes definitely when it comes to education education of the straight part of the society uh, when they figure out that it's just a show, that it's something for fun, for entertainment, and when they start to visit it as that, not as LGBT, just LGBT event, I think um, that would be a perfect opportunity for someone to organize something every day and to earn money every day out, out of drag and uh, to make it as their main job. So, yeah. do, do people tip in Serbia, like at shows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> I didn't uh, see tipping like in almost any of uh, the countries that I've been in in Balkan. I don't think that uh, people are, I will say, educated in that way. That that's yeah. the thing that most of the people should do. Um, I had an opportunity to perform in Tirana with uh, some of the Kosovo queens and the Albanian queens, and I was coming there with one more Serbian queen. And it was, uh, the name was, of course, funny, but uh, we really liked it. It was the Toxic uh, Triangle of Love, and it was uh, around the Valentine's. So um, I had also opportunity to work with, um, with really, um, you know, every neighbor country. <laughs> and yeah, tipping is a big no-no for the audience. <laughs> 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 but I think in, in, in that sense, I think there's also a, a lot of similarities in general, I would say, with the, the context the context for which most artists are doing their job. You know, like ar artists across fields face these kind of financial constraints and uh, and whatnot. But yet, of course, tapping into beat. 
finance or support, I would, of course, I would. Of course, it is easier uh, than for drag performers, I yeah. would say. But do you, um, Erblin, to ask you, do you also see that? That there's a different generation being built in this in this regard. Like there's a different network. Uh, also, now is there more and more uh, performers uh, uh, in drag? There's now we know that, for example, downtown Pristina. There's this uh, queer bar bubble. Uh, there's a lot of also shows that take that happen there. It's very nice because it's very central yeah. uh, in the city. But do you see that the kind of that the system of support is also expanding? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely expanding. And I mentioned before that I got hired also by other um, non-LGBT uh, organizations to, um, you know, perform. But it was, again, tied to an LGBT cause. So it wasn't just, you know, the, let us take a, a drag queen to host our festival. It was only because the festival's theme was love and rainbow and uh, supporting same-sex love. And so... Um, Bubble, the the queer bar in Pristina that opened, like it's been, you know, a, a pathway for people to uh, start. And uh, a, a few drag queens that had never performed before or never been on stage were born because of because of uh, Bubble's existence. And yes, it was it's nice, but again, it's. Um, now that I have been here for two years do, trying to live off of drag, I have realized that it's more of a seasonal gig because summer is when everybody is here and summer is when there's shows and it's pride, it's um, more uh, activities that uh, there is more opportunities for us to earn money. And uh, yes, a place like Bubble is hiring also uh, queens, even from the region that come. I know they just had somebody last weekend from uh, Macedonia, and um, they are offering an opportunity to perform and show your uh, talent on stage in front of an audience. But the more and more we get into winter, those shows become less and less because even as as a business, uh, they need a clientele to be able to to afford a performer. So it's really, you know, it's um, it's sad because in that way, the only place that we have is uh, where we are guaranteed to have a place where we perform is just one. And then what about the people that are in the area, like in Peya or Jakova, like the cities uh, um, in other places? I don't think it's sustainable enough yet for somebody to um, be a full-time drag queen and earn a living off of it. I mean, there's always has to be something for you to support. Um We know that even artists here have struggles, uh, especially actors. Um, if you're not part of the national theater, uh, as I'm like the uh, team, then you're not making money. So where, where can you go? So it's very limited and let alone for drag. Um, but I think bubble, it's, it's, um, it started something because then I, I started seeing even like service had drag shows and, um, you know, other bars that are like seeing the trend and they're picking up on it. It's going to take time to build, but I think the first steps have happened and people and more and more are seeing it. I mean, like they took uh, a drag queen in Big Brother last year. So like it's being incorporated in the media as well. And uh, I have been on many interviews and talked about the difference between drag and trans and like... Um, People are starting to wonder and ask because they hear we're such a small country that I do one show and then somebody has heard about Adelina somewhere. And uh, so that's the good thing because uh, the initiative has started. Now it's like, how do we go from here and amplify it and make it um, sustainable for an artist to be able to support themselves doing this? Yeah. And, and Lana, how do you see this in a regional uh, context? Because I think also a lot of uh, a lot of these shows that are also done uh, cross regionally, or you know, so there's a uh, drag performers going from one country to another. There's, I think, a lot of solidarity that is built along the way. A lot of kind of support systems being put put in place. Like how how do you see it at this regional uh, scale? What does that solidarity look like? If I might ask you like that, yeah. 
Yeah, well, uh, from my experience, I think that the drag community is really um, working perfectly like <laughs> together in the region. I mean, I really had uh, many opportunities and many good contacts with, with uh, drag performers and drag artists and organizers of, of different events. So my experience is that um, it's working uh, like uh, really good and really in, in a harmony. Um, I didn't ever notice something uh, that is off, as I can <laughs> say. Um, and when it comes to like, um, as Adelina said, in Kosovo, she tried like to to live um, uh, uh, just working as a as a drag queen and everything. I think that uh, here and in countries as Macedonia, Bosnia, and Croatia, I think that it will not happen in in the in the like short future. That uh, we will need much more time to try even to to work on something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I've I felt uh, really a big support <laughs> in the region, and um, I'm planning to uh, organize more Balkan shows next year and to invite uh, queens uh, to come to perform in Belgrade, Serbia, that are from other countries. I'm also uh, really close with Vaziria that. Um, She's an um, Albanian queen. She was uh, recently on a drag race Italy, and we are always talking and making plans for like um, combined projects and collaborations and everything. So yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah, and and, and how uh, what has it been for 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 you? I'm I'm curious. Like, how do you how do you see this possibility of uh, kind of like a larger solidarity being built? Because I think sometimes. In our region specifically, where there's also just a lot of this like violent past and wars and, mm -hmm. and conflict, there's a, a ethnicity is a very important for a lot of people in terms of self identification and whatnot. But sometimes, I think that the biggest ties tend to happen between groups and communities that are the most misunderstood or uh, or even discriminated against or, uh, or or oppressed. I think we've seen it a lot in general in the LGBTQ plus movement throughout the past two decades, if I may say, may say there's been a lot of very honest uh, collaboration because um, a lot of uh, non-acceptance towards them is, is rooted in the same patriarchal, so, like political and social causes. And so do you potentially see that drag is yet another place where where these, where these a different kind of solidarity can be built? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know that uh, I personally haven't had the chance to go and perform in uh, the neighboring countries yet. But I know in the past, like, I love the chain of network that they have the, through the organizations where they each travel to each other's pride um, and again it's once a year only because it's the pride month but at least something is happening and where you know a drag artist from Kosovo went to Belgrade in the city center and performed a song in Albanian like not even politics can achieve that so like it is a very um, uh, I think people that are oppressed for the same reasons they come they tend to come closer and bond uh, much easier than um, anything beyond that because I think we share the same struggles and we understand each other and I don't think nationality and uh, patriotism gets in the way of us understanding just human uh, nature and uh, people that have the same struggles. But um, yeah, I think what really uh, could be cool is something that has been kind of floating in my head has been that um, you know, we have very talented queens in uh, Kosovo, uh, uh, Serbia, Macedonia, and all these neighboring countries. But it's not enough to, for example, to bring, you know, a, a RuPaul's Drag Race in just one of the countries. And I was like, why not combine all of these and make it RuPaul's Drag Race Balkans, for example? And I think that would be like the only way to kind of commercialize uh, drag in this region to make it more profitable if if all of us come together as a group because it's, you know, it, I'm one of the only working queens in this country. There's 
drag queens, I think over 10 drag queens, but um, maybe five of them get to perform in a year. And then uh, just me who gets more and more gigs uh, just because of my connections or, or whatnot. And then, um, but for all of them to have something to look forward to, something like that needs to happen. I think because mainstream has changed uh, the game in all the Western countries, uh, countries. The only reason why those countries have, because even in uh, places like London and those places, five years ago when there was no RuPaul's Drag Race, it wasn't like everybody had a job. It was only one drag queen that has built their reputation and, you know, like me being the resident queen of Bubble and that's it. Um, but for all of them to have the opportunity and do something, it needs something like um, to become more mainstream. And I think um, we have an opportunity for all of us to get together and create something. I mean, uh, so th I think that would be the only way to tackle this um, visibility thing because uh, when we come together, we can do something. Yeah, and I think hopefully with a... Like more and more and the more and more of the individual travel, but I, I think that's slowly maybe going into that direction. Uh, and what we also what Lana was talking about the fact that there is a lot of these corporations and that actually through yeah. drag performance that right. you've had also the opportunity to go to Albania and uh, to to Macedonia and all yes, these countries. Yes. So I, I'm hoping that it is yeah. kind of going in that uh, in that direction. Yeah, you wanted to and say. I think that. Yeah, yeah, that uh, as Adelina said, uh, drag Balkan, drag race Balkan combined would be uh, perfect for like uh, getting. Yeah, just like where ideas maybe can also come alive is this idea that you just <laughs> that had that maybe what is needed yeah. is a larger network of like in the Balkan uh, yeah. context to really start thinking about drag also as a. As, as a career besides it being a, a, a form of art. I wanted to thank uh, the both of you uh, for being on the show. Very nice to uh, uh, to talk to you. And uh, thanks so much for sharing your yeah your personal and all your insight. Thanks, Erblin and Lana. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Other Talking Points is a K2.0 podcast. You can listen to it regularly on our website, kosovo2.0.com or by subscribing to K2.0 on Spotify, Apple Music, or YouTube.